Jeffrey, thank you so much for uh, for joining me. It's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. Thank you. So if we could just start, I'm going to turn this off too. Yeah, I'm going um, to turn, turn this off as well. The beepings and the notifications. Turn life off for a second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. Would you mind just giving us just a little background on uh, who you are and, and a little bit about your background for those who may or may not know of you and then we can dive in? Sure. Um, I don't want, I don't want to sound like a resume. That's why I'm, I'm hesitant. Well, you're a professor. I am. I'm i yeah. I'm a professor of religion at Rice University in Houston, Texas. I just finished four years in the Dean's office. I was an associate Dean in the school of humanities. So I, I think about the humanities as a whole, in the context of higher education. Um, I spent the first half of my career really working on erotic forms of mystical literature um, in both Asia and and Europe and, and the kind of the Euro-American scene. Mm -hmm. And for the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, I've really looked at alternative currents in American culture. And I now work on, I think, what most people would call the paranormal, um, yeah. extraordinary or extreme Events that are often coded or interpreted religiously, not always, um, yeah. but certainly often. And so that's what I do now. Cool. May I ask, like, your interest as of late or the last few years or however long it's been into the more paranormal or metaphysical or, dare we say, spiritual, was there a, any sort of happening in your life that led to that? <laughs> or tell me a little bit about that shift. Yeah, people ask me that a lot. Um Yes and no. I first of all, I'm I'm kind of a spiritual dud. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means I don't walk around having these kinds of experiences. I mean, some people just sit down and meditate, and they're boom, or so they say. Yeah. Well, I actually <laughs> believe them. That's I, true. I, I, I think people are like really different and put <laughs> together differently. And I am, I'm pretty thick. Um, but I, you know, I have had a few of these experiences over the course of my career or course of my life. And I started out wanting to be a monk. Um, I've had a profound kind of religious or spiritual orientation from the time of uh, that I was an adolescent at 12 or 13. And I spent four years in a Catholic seminary wanting to join mm. monastic life. So I've had these religious and, and theological interests from really from day one. Um, and I've had odd experiences as far as I can see back. Um, but I wasn't interested in this, this topic. I mean, I was really interested in the way human sexuality and spiritual experience uh, interfaced or came together. And I felt that people weren't being honest about it. I, actually, I don't think they're being honest about it still. Um, mm. I, I don't think the religious mm. traditions are honest about it. I, I, think, I think we're... We're duping ourselves um, on a lot of levels, and and I don't I don't blame anyone. I don't I don't believe in secret committees somewhere, you know, controlling the levers. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. I I don't I don't think human beings have owned up to how tight um, uh, sexual and spiritual experiences really are, and so. I got into a lot of trouble saying those things uh, in the 1990s, and I had to reimagine myself and, and reimagine my intellectual career. So I got interested in California and the counterculture in particular at, after the turn of the millennium, really as a way to survive. Yeah. Frankly, it was I, I was trying to survive spiritually and intellectually, and I ended up at a place called S S the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, yeah. and got to know a lot of people who really shaped the counterculture um, on a lot of different levels. And I was really impressed with what I saw. And I, I, I didn't think these people were going to um, uh, harass or, 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 um, um, follow me for my interests uh, and quite the contrary they, they they told me things i i couldn't write about i was like you know i can't write about that and they're like yeah yeah but i want to tell you i'm like okay, okay. in the tubs yeah yeah i mean oh my god the things i heard um 
and you know, writing this history of of the counterculture, um, there's a big book, big book called Esalen, America and the Religion of No Religion, and it's really not just about Esalen. It's really about everything that's happening. Then, I. I kept I kept talking to people who would tell me these crazy stories um, <laughs> that I realized I realized were true, <laughs> and and by true I mean that they happen. I just mean that they happen. I you know right 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 right. And I w- tried to talk about those things in my professional world with other scholars of religion. I just got really weird <laughs> looks and. Uh, they didn't want to say, they didn't want to. And I'm like, you know, this happens. Oh, right? he's back from Esalen with yeah. his stories. Yeah. yeah but I'm like, you know, this is, <laughs> this is actually happening. And, and what I, what I realized is that most of my colleagues whom I, I just adore. I mean, I listen, I'm an academic, I'm a nerd. I, I realized that they, they knew I was, they, they knew these things. They, 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 they understood but but that the field and the culture was so censorious and so in such a denial around them that I just I found that to be a really interesting question. Um, and so I got really interested in kind of the intellectual history of the paranormal and and how it began among intellectuals and then and then floated away and, and then was kind of entered entertainment and, and film and, and things and um and it's only now, I think, coming back and into serious mm-hmm. attention. Yeah. I have a connection with Esalen as well. I've been, uh, my partner and I have been leading retreats there for the last five or six years, and we're going oh, to be there good. in September. Yeah. Oh, good. What's your retreat on? What, like, what kind of retreats? Uh, music, primarily, uh-huh. and the role of uh, music and ceremony and just using that through different modalities uh-huh. and seeing what happens to you. So it's sort of in a, a little micro laboratory where we do things like music ceremonies or music with yoga or co-creative music or different forms of music and listening and sound. And they get to experiment to build maybe a little recipe of what works for them. Yeah. Well, 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 Esalen's my spiritual home and yeah. um, I, I help run the place and, and uh, I don't, I don't control or, or influence programming, which is, what brought you brings you there, but I I certainly know I certainly think about Esalen almost every day and mm-hmm. and uh, help help um, imagine its future. When was the last time you were there? Um, well, you know, COVID kind of destroyed everything. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to be there this summer again. I think I was. Th- I mean, I don't remember the last time I was there was probably last summer. Um, so it's been a while. Um, They're doing. Um... They just announced it. This thing um, about altered states. In, yeah, yeah. You should come out. It would get you out yeah. for that. Well, I, I I used to go out four or five times a year, and and I've taught there for a month at a time, many times, and yeah, I've spent a good share of my life there. Yeah, um, but you know, the last four years I've been in university administration, and we had a pandemic, of course, and that really put the kibosh on things um, in terms of sure. big. Sure. Well, I want to ask you about the human potential mo- movement or different ways we could define it. And Eslin certainly was at the forefront of this for a long time, but the, the manifestations it's taking today and sort of the role that even things like this play in that or, um, you know, yeah. people just talk, you know, the way influencers can come up completely outside any institutions or any sort of criticism and we can just like guys like myself can just like have opinions about things and right. God forbid they listen to me, but you get on people such as yourselves. And I'm just curious, and this is a bit of a self-serving question because I wonder about this a lot. When we get into the endeavor of improvement and introspection, where are the pitfalls, especially today, how that interfaces with the internet and modern life, social media, where it becomes a problem? Yeah. Or off course, um, blah, 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 narcissism, et cetera. So you want me to be the crabby old guy now? Well, I'm usually the crabby crank. And so, <laughs> uh, yeah, make me look good. No, <laughs> yeah. no, seriously, I think it's a, it's very important because, um, that lack of criticism, I, I actually think it could be dangerous and we're, we're in a place where we do have a lot of influence. People have a lot of questions 
and things are getting more and more weird and dynamic and, and transforming where people are looking where to turn. And I think for a lot, I know a lot of my friends and colleagues and people in this field, they genuinely want to help. But mm -hmm. you can be deluded in some ways inside systems that you're in or helping right. promote. And I think I thought about Eslin. I'm like, well, I, th I think Eslin, yeah, still is certainly hearts in the right place. But we're trying to figure out where can we go awry. Yeah. So, wow, I have a lot to say about that. I um, thought you would. Yeah. I, and, and I think a lot of it, I think, will agree with your concerns. Um, let me, let me kind of, I don't even know where to start. Um, so first of all, I work with young people. I mean, I teach uh, 18 to 22 year olds in the classroom, you know, pretty much every day during the school year, every other day. And I work with graduate students who are usually in their thirties and forties. And then of course I work with people on, in other ways too. And I think, you know, I think a lot of things have broken down. Um, I, I think about religion a lot. Historical religions had a way of reproducing themselves and passing their, their worldviews on to further generations through through temples and well, music and scripture and and teaching and authority and all kinds of ways that was very um, efficient and very effective in creating a worldview and a stable worldview. Mm -hmm. the The downside of that is is that it it end up hurting or suppressing a lot of people who didn't fit into those worldviews or into those teachings. And I think we're very aware of that now. Um, I think people are, and by people, I mean young people, I mean people of all ages, are really concerned about the ways that their religions and cultures have have excluded other human beings. And I think a lot of thoughtful, heartfelt people don't want to live in those exclusions anymore. And there aren't any clear answers, though. Um, the you know Eslin's not an answer to to this question either. The spiritual but not religious um, moniker is not an answer either. It's a kind of placeholder. Um, I think people are are really upset morally for very good reasons, but they don't know where to turn because there isn't anywhere to turn. Uh -huh. Um. And I think things are breaking down. And my own response to that is to let things break down. I mean, it's not it's not that I can do anything about it, but but to be curious and interested in that breakdown and not to morally condemn it like a lot of people do. Um, and the reason I'm so interested in what what most people call the paranormal is, is it's very deconstructive. It 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 appears in the gaps, it appears in the margins, and it appears when th things, structures, identities are breaking down. And I think we're definitely in a moment in which things are breaking down. Mm -hmm. And I I personally think now this is just a personal belief they should break down. I I think they're they've been pretty bad. Um, but I don't have an answer to what comes next. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody does, by the way. Um, when I was young, I'll just tell you another story. When I was younger, you know, and as a graduate student, I, I imagined that someone somewhere had the answer to things. And it was just a matter of reading books or talking to people or maybe meeting the right guru or something. And I just don't believe that anymore. I, I don't think anybody has the answer. I, I think we're, we're basically lost and that we should be lost mm -hmm. um, because our previous being claims to being found were, were really, really hateful to a lot of, a lot of human beings. Um, and so that, that's kind of where I'm at. I, and so my, my spiritual response to this is, embrace the uncertainty and embrace the the breakdown but don't pretend that that you have or anyone has some kind of answer to this because i just i just don't think they do uh and and i i think we can come to some answers i think we can 
come to some bigger stories that that can start to address this, but that's going to take some time, and it's going to take some generations, and it's going to take some cultural investment, which I don't think we we're serious about yet. Do you think a logical response to a time where we feel lost is to grieve? Like that yeah. is a natural reaction now more than action. Or well, I don't want to compartmentalize it too much, but uh, you, you know, one of one of the people he didn't actually help train me. I didn't really know Peter very well when I was in school. It seems Peter Holmans. He's long gone now, but Peter Peter's basic argument was that the entire professional study of religion was one huge act of mourning. Tuh. And of, of the human condition. <laughs> <laughs> well, of a of a lost religious object ah. that that it was no longer possible to believe in 1990 or 1980 the way it was in 1580 or 1480 or you know just pick a date, and you know other people have said similar things that the last half a century and and certainly in Europe and and Euro American culture have been devastating on a lot of basic belief systems. Um, and nihilism has been the kind of cultural challenge for a couple hundred years now. And I think we're still in a, a nihilistic moment. And I think young people in particular pick that up very quickly. And it's not just mourning and grief. I think it's depression. I think I think there's a lot of depression in in the culture too around around this particular this this really deep cultural pro problem. It's, it's not it's not superficial. Are you speaking about nihilism almost like from a religious context, like the religion of nihilism? No, I mean nihilism. In the, yeah, I mean nihilism in the philosophical sense that there is no meaning or purpose uh -huh. or goal in life. That you know, you, you know, to each his own, as it were, and and it's just about going to the go, whatever numbers in your bank account and and you know how how successful you are. In a, in a financial way, it, it, there's, there's no there's no big story mm -hmm. that that we're embedded in. It's it's it, it, we're not going anywhere. There's there's no meaning to anything. And I and I don't personally believe that, but I think that's the reigning worldview that we exist in. And I think the the quicker we admit that, um, the the quicker we can start to deal with it and and address it honestly. Do you think that like that kind of hyper individualism is partially responsible for pushing us into tribalism, like a search for community and affirmation and otherness? I think fundamentalism is a response to nihilism. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I I think fundamentalism is very attractive to people because it gives it pretends to give certainty in a world that is uncertain and. Um, I think that's attractive to people because we need that. Sure, you know, we, yeah. we we just need, we need to live in communities and we need walls around ourselves. And I I don't I don't know I don't dismiss that fundamentalism or what we call exclusivism in the study of religion is very attractive and and very emotionally um, powerful. And and I, I think that's something we really – and I think, frankly, like the sciences, for example, do a horrific job. I think they 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 prop up fundamentalism, frankly, um, <laughs> because they, they, they create more and more nihilism. And so people just become more and more fundamentalist <laughs> because it's like, well, screw that. I mean I, – I, mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah, I, I don't blame you, but mm – -hmm. I don't believe your answers either. Um, it's just not. It's it's a matter of being honest and saying, "Look, that that doesn't work anymore." I heard you say that like materialism is not like a direct uh, response from science. That's more like an interpretation. Yeah, and maybe that's a bit like I hear you what you're saying. It's like it's not actually science as much as what we're take what we're doing with our interpretation of it. Yeah, as a response say, in itself. Yeah, I, I should say scientists don't help. I mean, <laughs> science. Well, again, science is scientists. I, I, I don't. Science is what scientists do, and and what they say. And, and unfortunately, they say some pretty silly uh, and philosophically naive things. Um, 
that I think make the situation far, far worse than it than it needs to be. I, I love science. I love what science has done. But scientists, I, 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 you know, I argue with them all the time because they're just saying things that are just not part of science. And they conflate um, a kind of pragmatic or technological value with the truth of things. And I just think that's wrong. I just think that adds to our problems. Yeah. So if that's the case, and that's part of the predicament we're in as a people, kind of a maybe a corner we've put ourselves in and we're looking for answers, uh, it seems that the other polarity of that would be somatics or the felt experience or the individual felt experience, which is something I feel it's difficult to at least argue with your own felt experiences. That's why certain psychedelic experiences for me have been so salient because I, I don't, I, I'm not really interpreting as much like that happened. I don't, I had certain feelings of understanding and right. now that's part of my life. Um, and in some ways it helps me to put my arms around a bit, some of these complex ideas of loss or feeling loss, but also of things that my, I want to find an answer in my mind, but there's no answer. Like right now is a lot of wanting to find an answer. And as you're saying, maybe there isn't one at this moment or it's becoming still. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of psychedelic experiences or altered states in general as a way, yeah. as part of this? Yeah, again, I have tons of thoughts and opinions ah. there. That I'm happy to impose on you. Well, um, let me make it more pointed. Uh, we all we don't have to go into the history or, or even, but where it's at right now, because it's really burgeoning into this space. Some people call it a resonant, and there's pros and cons to that. It's getting commercialized. It's getting also... Mm -hmm. Sort of like microdosing, and it's just uh, it's where we're at today with it. Yeah, so I, I I know a lot of the researchers, and I'm very tapped into that community. And um, it's striking to me that none of the researchers ever hire a humanist or a historian or a philosopher. They just go and they hire more psychiatrists and more farm. They deal with pharmaceutical companies, or they go to their lab, or what they use science to try to understand something that is fundamentally not science. And I think that's extremely dangerous um, and naive. Um, and I think what should happen now is that these researchers should be talking to philosophers and historians and scholars who actually know something about mm. mystical experience. And it's not that they have the answers either. I, I'm not suggesting these people have the answers. I'm just saying this is a, a an experience um, uh, of consciousness that is not an object that can be measured in your in your mm. scientific method. And please stop saying that. And and you know, I also don't think that we're being honest about the the negative aspects of psychedelics. I mean, people have really bad experiences on psychedelics too, and that's part of the sacred by the way. Any scholar of religion will, will shake you loose immediately from the idea that the sacred is the good. That's that's complete nonsense, and 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 so the idea that people have negative experiences on psilocybin or, or DMT or whatever it is does not surprise me in the least. Yeah, I, I would expect that, um, but that doesn't mean it's negative. That doesn't mean there are demons in the room. It just means it's a sacred experience, and we have to take that in as well and and come to understand that. But again, nobody's listening to us. No, nobody's talking to people who actually know something about this stuff. They're talking to scientists and chemists and, and psychologists who are just not the people you should be talking to. I'm sorry. It's just, I just think yeah. those are not the right, right, right methods to, to uh, figure out what's going on. Um, and again, it's not that the humanists and the philosophers suddenly have the answer. I'm not suggesting that. But they will have questions and they will nuance our thinking and our cultures around this in a way that no one else can. Um, anthropologists, too, by the way. Anthropologists tend to be great on this topic. Um, that I never would have thought. I suppose because of the use of, of these sort of substances in the past and just sort of like recognizing practices? Well, anthropologists are trained to go to, first of all, not assume the universalism of their own culture and their own understanding of what's mm -hmm. real or not. 
and they go into the field, whatever that is, and they have very strange experiences, and they come back, and their whole all their whole professional career is about trying to make sense of those experiences that often you can't mm -hmm. make sense of and do not fit into the framework of, of uh, you know, historical Marxism or something, which, which you know, you, the academy assumes to be the case. And so I, I'm very fond of, anthrop of anthropologists who have taken that, that ontological turn, as it were, um, and I'm, I'm very fond of philosophers who have as well, but wow, they're few and far between. Let me tell you, uh, it's it's a hard it's a hard it's a hard path, um, in, in, because the academy wants to assume a kind of rational subject, and that the, the consciousness is the body, and and they make all kinds of assumptions that simply don't don't follow through. You know, when when you start talking about altered states. It's one thing to, I suppose, study the changes or results, like just measures of how people feel or um, like is this someone more or less depressed down the line, things like that. I mean, it's it's good to know, uh, but I, I think the experience itself, you could never put your arms around it ever. Is, I mean, is the, is the point of your psychedelic openings that you feel good now? I mean, is that really the point? I mean... No, it's it's spiritual. Honestly, it's more just like it's some of the deepest. Uh, I don't have more answers when I'm done. I just feel um, richer, broader in a way. But there's it's I, there's understandings that I can't even put into words. Yeah, and they have nothing to do with feeling good, or you know, they're, they're, it's not a it's not a pharmaceutical or a therapeutic result. It's it's a spiritual result, and. And I hear this over and over from people that what's actually given in these states is something that doesn't fit into the questionnaires and to the, <laughs> the, the bubble. The, yeah. The bubble. That, Which uh, one of these? I don't know. <laughs> right. I mean, you, to sort of put it, put it in the terms I think is, is helpful here. I, you know, I, I, first of all, I've done psychedelics once in another country because I was so afraid of the legal, ramifications of this country which are brutal um but i i know a lot of people who have been on psychedelics and i talk to them about this and and you know what they tell me is that the 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 psilocybin or the dmt or whatever it is it doesn't actually cure whatever condition they have but it relativizes that condition and yeah. it puts it in a um a context that is much much bigger um, than they realized before. And it's not that the condition goes away. It's just that it doesn't mean the same thing anymore. It's like, yeah, okay. Um, so I think that's really helpful. And the other thing I think, and I've said this before, is monotheism has not done well with psychoactive plants. <laughs> that's Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and the reason is that monotheism works with a logic that's, that is essentially supernatural, that the agency of the religious event is outside the natural world. It, it, it lies in God. And so any genuine experience that's religious has to be, a, the agent has to be God. But with you ingest a mushroom or, or a vine or, or a tea or something, it's clearly part of the natural world. And the experience one has is a kind of panpsychic or or monistic experience of the natural world. It's it's a very different theology than than this monotheistic theology that has really uh, defined a lot of Western culture. And so I I think there's a theological crisis going on, and and my worry is a kind of a, a kind of pushback um, that you know of 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 a kind of monotheism versus the, the psychedelic renaissance that I think is also going on. But I think there are profound theological issues here, religious questions that are not even being addressed. Such um, as? Like what's a... Well, well is it, is, does God exist outside the universe or is God the universe? You know, or or is it both? I was gonna say, take a take a mushroom, like both. <laughs> well, okay, but that's a theology, you know, that yeah. we, that most people don't don't have. 
Mm. And um, that would change everything. You know, including our ecological crisis, by the way. Yeah. If, if we if we really understood human agency and the human being in a way that was in a completely different religious register, I think we would make different decisions and we would we would act differently. Is that part of what you were saying when you thought like we're not using the right instruments for today, or what are those instruments you think would be more relevant? Um, altered states. I, I think, I th I think we need a method that honors altered states as veridical and as real sources of knowledge. And what science does is it dismisses all altered states as a statistical blip. You know, they don't matter, and they're not taken as evidence because they're just anomalies in the system. And I, they're anecdotal to use the dismissive language of, of the, the debunkers. I think that's just fundamentally wrong. I think it's philosophically wrong. I think it's morally wrong. And I think it's, it's philosophically wrong. Um, and I think we need to say that and, 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 and say that to these people who are saying the opposite. I've told this joke before, but it fits in what you're talking about. Terrence McKenna, you know, people will say, well, you saw a UFO. You're like, yes, I did. And they're like, were you loaded? And he says, well, of course I was. That's why I saw the UFO. <laughs> <laughs> That's the re so uh, segue, but same subject. Um, things like, you know, just cut last few days, there's been some strange developments in uh sort of governmental panels and some of these things that I were watched up... it, by the way i watched the congressional hearing i know exactly what you're talking about yeah, yeah. what i've followed this for decades and I, I can see some of these players that before i was a bit dismissive of and here they are and here i'm like what is going on uh we think about the mythic and the poetic as being the answers and uh, sort of the things that can't quite be pinned down and uh, how do you see this fitting in or what do you think is going on I think the UFO, and by the way, I insist that it's a UFO. The UAP stuff drives me nuts. It's because they it's go just, underwater. That was it's their thing. Just, it's not just well, aerial. Okay, okay. But still, the UAP, it's an attempt to kind of cover up this. It's like calling It's a cover up of a cover up. Yeah. It is a cover up. Of, it's like calling psychedelics entheogens or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, just come on. Let's, let's mm -hmm. just let's deal with our past. Um, I think the UFO or the UAP issue is actually really sig significant here. And if you watch the congressional hearings, um, what you saw was that it's okay to talk about this today if it's a technology or it involves national security or it's a military professional. It's not okay to listen to the experiencers where the experience is going to be way weirder than we heard yesterday. I'll tell you that. Yeah, there's more details there, I'm sure. There, yeah. There's a lot more going on than you we're being told in Congress. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, my colleagues in this area, they'll say, well, let's just get, let's get this, let's get this going. And it's kind of like the psychedelic community, the, the psychiatrist It's like, no, let's get the pharmaceutical companies involved and let's get the laws changed. And then we're going to talk about these mystical experiences. And I think the attitude in the UFO uh, world is something like that. The people who are really into it and who know a lot about it know that the technological aspect is only one. The physical technological thing is just kind of the, the surface of a of a rabbit hole in which a lot of paranormal things, frankly, happen around UFO encounters that nobody's talking about. Mm. Um, and I think, so I think it's a similar situation. I'm fascinated by the developments as well. I think they're good. I love the fact that we're in Congress yesterday and that we have politicians who can talk about these things without losing their, their reputations or their careers. Um, but again, we're just talking about it in terms of national security. We're not really talking about the phenomenon itself, which is, again, much weirder <laughs> and much more trickier than than is being talked about. Yeah. Beyond it being weird, there's also like an element of confounding comicalness to it. It's, McKenna would also say things like, and why is it that, though, sometimes when you have these uh, sightings and so forth. Some sometimes this what not like 
not like Navy pilots and stuff, but like the people who, who have these stories, it's always like there's always some caveat or some strain. It's like, oh, it's you. It's old Joe who's always drinking or it's like, and it's almost like it's built into the system somehow where it's like we yeah. can't quite get over the like, it's just yeah. enough. And anything from crop circles to yeah, sightings to stories and it does make it, even the people who are pushing a lot, I mean, Tom DeLonge, who's one of the guys who's behind, you know, it's a, I'm a musician. He's a musician from a band uh, from the 90s. It's like, right. it's almost a joke. I'm, no disrespect, Tom. It's just, you know, I'm sure he has to overcome that as well. It's yeah. strange. I don't think we're, you know, a, a colleague of my name, George Hansen, wrote a book called The Trickster and the Paranormal. And his argument is essentially that the paranormal is itself is deceptive. And, and I think we're not willing to talk about that. I, I think we're willing to talk about human deception and, and di disinformation campaigns and intelligence communities and, and co assumed corporate uh, projects, et cetera. But we're not actually willing to say yet in public that, you know what, maybe the phenomena itself is deceiving uh, us uh, wow. and that that's part of the part of the landscape here and you know what again the i'll tell you the religious has always deceived it's always been deceptive it's not just you, the ufo thing is a very modern sci-fi version of something that's been happening for millennia and and i don't think again we're talking to the historians and the philosophers and, and the, the people who actually know something about this, I think we're just assuming that we can solve or, or address this thing with technology and science and, and military, and we just can't. It's just, it's just not possible. Well, what are you and your friends saying or thinking that this, is this some sort of um, unveiling or is, is it is it increasing or is it more we just have more cameras and we're noticing more things or is well, it our actually... Techn our technology is better, sure. right? Our yeah. radar is better, so we can see things we couldn't see before. But human beings have always had. Listen, my joke is, you know, strange beings come out of the sky and screw with people. Well, that's religion. I, I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I mean, and it's a joke, but it's also true that human beings have been reporting these sorts of events for as far as we can see back in history. And I, I'm not proposing a naive. History Channel scenario here. What I'm what I, what I'm exactly saying is that our ancestors used religious and mythological language to describe these events, and today we use scientific and technological and military language, and neither one of them work. Um, that whatever's going on is escaping those religious and mythological frameworks. It's also escaping the scientific and technological frameworks. And we simply do not have a framework in which we can understand these, this. And wow, that that's the that's my argument. That's crazy. It's like we have no tools to even approach. I don't, see, I don't think we have I, I, I wouldn't say that. I think we actually do have tools to approach it, but we're not using them. Like, like apophatic forms of mystical experience, I think is very close to what's actually going on. But no one's going to talk about Meister Eckhart or Nagarjuna or, you know, or Plotinus, um, you know, in these contexts. Um, unless, of course, you're a crazy historian of religions, you know, a crazy professor of religion somewhere. So I do think we have resources but they're not they're not being used and i think the traditional religious ones and the traditional scientific ones are are inadequate hmm. and i don't I... know i don't know that third thing i'm talking about i'm not saying we have all the answers of the past and so we just have to read eckhart and nagarjuna right, right. i'm not saying that i'm saying we have resources in our cultural past to deal with the complexity of this thing but that that itself is a beginning. It, it's not. It's not a conclusion, or it's not an adequate way to address this thing. Do you see it fit the phenomenon fitting into the same way you might view synchronicity, or 
it's even filled just, with synchronicity, by the way. It, 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 it provokes synchronicity. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about how we can look at these, these viewpoints, because paranormal, synchronicity, psychedelic mysticism, I feel I'm all kind of like swimming in a similar world. And I, I'm trying yeah. to put this for my own sense of meaning on top of like, whatever this acceleration or concrescence, it feels like we are moving towards. I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I, I love Terrence McKenna. I mean, come on. I I think the guy was onto something and I know Dennis quite well. And I, you know, Terrence loved Esalen. Yeah. And, and he was one of our most beloved teachers in the 1990s before he died in, in 2000. And I think Terrence had a sense of a kind of the eschaton that, that was was deeply felt and i think the ufo stuff i think the psychedelic stuff is is part of that eschaton or part of that ending part of that coming apart that i was referring to earlier um and we don't know how it comes together you know um but again i think i guess at the end of the day i i do have a lot of confidence in um future generations and and in human beings um but i don't have a lot of confidence in our present answers or our present ways of handling this because i i just don't i don't think it's handling it i think it's denying it hmm. and how do you see ai fitting into that do you think it's part of the same <laughs> you're just going everywhere aren't you yeah um, well these are all the things i'm thinking about um yeah well because that that to me is not actually separate in a lot of ways. And it it's kind of amazing to me. Anyone could stand back from all of this stuff and just be like, these are all just disparate, like individual, like AI is a channel and a vertical and uh, these different things going, even, you know, from politics uh, to religion, to uh, geopolitical situations, to technology, to, you know, psychedelics. Yeah. So my own view, and this is, again, it's not a very learned view, but my own view is that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligent. Um, it's it's very much uh, uh, a creation of human beings, and it the the idea that um, you know computers are going to become conscious or intelligent is a materialist or physicalist dream, right? Uh, and I think it's just mistaken. Um, I don't think computers ever will be conscious or or intelligent in that way. I think they'll be able to mimic and and do a lot of really cool things and pretend to be intelligent and we can figure things out with AI that we can't figure out now. So I'm not I'm not suggesting otherwise, but I think the idea that that computers um can take on intelligence or consciousness is 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 just like saying that consciousness is is a function of brain cells. And I just don't believe it. I just think that's mistaken. I think the evidence suggests quite the contrary, that the human brain is a kind of filter or receiver of, of consciousness. And that has tremendous implications, including for AI, um, which I think are, are need to be listened to as well. Um, so I, you know, I, think, I think AI is like any other technology. It can be used for very nefarious reasons and human beings are going to screw this thing up like they've screwed everything else up but that doesn't mean that the the technology itself or the computer science itself has to be nefarious it, it doesn't but it's always a function of the human beings who are using it definitely and it's not to say i mean on one level we're biological but we're a kind of computer with neurotransmitters and electrical impulses and and we don't know how that makes what we perceive as consciousness or identity or if there's some being in that the soul so, you know how is a machine different i just know i agree with you i don't think it could ever be conscious but at the same time i'm like i i wonder like if, if you got down to making computers almost biological is there what makes it alive Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it has to do with w how you think of the human being. And I, I just I just don't think of us in mechanical or, or strictly biological terms. And I think that I think the evidence suggests that as well. It's, that's just that's not just a um, that's that's not an assumption, an un, 
uneducated assumption I'm making, there are a lot of paranormal things that happen that make absolutely no sense if consciousness is produced by the brain and the body. But they actually, they actually make really good sense if consciousness is distributed throughout the universe and the, the brain and the body are just picking it up and receiving it, as it were. So it's more of like an interconnected view? Like if you, if, you, if you see that sort of interconnectedness, there's a lot more interaction, cause and effect. Yeah, I mean, we can get into this. I, you know, I wrote a book called The Flip, and, and I describe myself as a dual aspect monist. And essentially what that comes down to is this idea that consciousness is, is fundamental to the co to cosmos or universe, and the, the brain and the body are translating it into a person, or into a social ego, but it's not that social ego. And, and reality is not mental, and it's not material. It's, it's something um, beyond both of those things that, that, that certainly appear or split up in the human being, but only split apart because of the human being. The, the reality itself is, is, is neither um, in, in, that, in that particular position. Um, and I think that's kind of where a lot of this stuff goes, frankly. I think it 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 it, it tends in that direction. What what I, is de death in that model though? Is that just that then it's just the ceasing of the particular identity being formed by just the body? Basically, I mean, I t it depends on what you mean by the identity. Um, it, it dual aspect monism, the, the the way I'm using it, presumes that Jeff. Um, is really a function of this body and of this society and this language game we're in right now. Um, and that when Jeff um, dies, so what? I, I mean, um, that just means the body and the brain um, pass away. Um, and, and, and it might mean that the identity itself is no more, but that doesn't mean that the consciousness that enlivens Jeff is no more. It, 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 it exists before him and after him in a, in a really profound way. Do you differentiate between metaphysics or paranormal or is a definition thing? I, I don't understand the question. Well, I'm, I heard you talk about metaphysics uh, and politics, which I was like, wow, never thought about those two together, how they yeah. influence one another. But when you use the word paranormal, I'm just curious, like, before I ask that question, if it's different than metaphysics. To me, the, the, a, a paranormal phenomenon is, is an event that exists in both the physical world, but also in the mental or subjective world. It, it's something that violates our normal distinction between the inside and the outside. So a synchronicity is a perfect example of, of a real, real powerful synchronicity is a perfect example of a paranormal event. And I also use paranormal in, in the way it was intended. It was, it was coined in 1903 in, in French, and it simply meant something that is happening in the physical world for which we do not have a scientific explanation mm. and that relates to some kind of subjective state or altered state of, of, of the person experiencing it. Uh, I don't use it in the sense, you know, the Barnes and Noble romantic paranormal roman romance session. Uh, I don't. I don't use it in this. It's not about vampires and and um, it's not about sexy vampires. It's 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 about it's about paradoxical events that don't fit into a a, a, a psychological or a, a physicalist model. Okay, so I hear the trickster in there again too, sort of from a mythical point of view. Well, this so, is why it's tricky, is because it's it's tricky in relationship to our assumptions, the way we mm. split the world up, which is just not so. Well, how are we splitting the world? How are most people splitting? Is it too dualistic? Or... Yeah, I mean, okay. if you're like me, I mean, I, I I know how I split it up. There's 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 an inner state that I identify with myself, and then there's these physical objects out there, and they don't have anything to do with one another. <laughs> they're completely they're completely separate from me, <laughs> and um, that's that's how I split the world up. I assume that's how most people split the world up. And and what happens in a paranormal event is that breaks down, and the physical world suddenly behaves like it's you. Um, and I would argue that's because it is. Um, mm. You know, you the world, the physical world is you, and you are the physical world. And this distinction you're making between this interior self and this exterior world is just not what's actually so. So, in some ways, do we do we need more metaphysics? As, Absolutely. 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So we, what, should be, we should be talking <laughs> metaphysics. And again, that's precisely what you can't do. You're not allowed to do that, by the no, way. No, no, you're not. I, mean, I guess Marianne Williamson is taking a stab in some ways, but that no, it's not talked about. It's actually derided immediately as pseudoscience or just not even listened to. Yeah. Is there a way to thread that needle, do you think, to bring that more into the cultural conversation? Well, I, I think what's happening in Congress and <laughs> and you know the psychedelic renaissance is going to force the issue i think you know at some point we're going to have to start talking metaphysics and um we're not doing that yet because we we think it's all about pharmaceutical companies and, and the military but but eventually we're going to figure out you know what it's it's it actually has to do with reality and and the nature of, of mind or consciousness and we have to sort of rethink rethink everything wow yeah, things got a lot stranger when we got so interconnected on this planet through devices and the internet and information. And it's sort of like that's almost a manifestation of perhaps how things have been. But well, let, let me let me be the crabby old guy for a minute. Yeah. I mean, the, so the internet and the digital world, which we're in right at the moment, right? I mean, this is it. Um, it's given us a lot of things, but that's how the devil works. You know, the devil gives you things as as he takes a lot of other things away. And one of the things I've noticed in myself, but also in my students, is that we don't read anymore. Yeah. And I mean that very seriously. Um, well, it's true. Reading, it's just on the number of books sold, like, you know, 50,000 books now is a bestseller. And it's, it is a lot of books, but that's like, if you sell 5,000, that's like a big deal. I mean... Reading, long reading, and tra the transformation that occurs through reading is simply not a practice anymore. People think they can get everything off the internet or Google their way into a, enlightenment, and it's just not true. Um, and there's a kind of what I call a Twitter. For, I know Twitter doesn't exist anymore, but there's a kind of Twitterization of consciousness that that has been going on for about a decade or so. And I've noticed in my students, and I've noticed in myself. So I, I you know, I take. I, I'm guilty as well. There's a there's a decline of attention, yeah. That that has been going on for 20 years now, or at least 10, 15 years, and I think that's a real, real serious problem. Um, I, I try to talk to people about ideas, and they haven't read anyone. They don't. They don't know anything, they, and they think they can. You know, they can figure out Marx or Hegel or Nietzsche and or Garjan or Shankara or whoever it is, but just looking it up on Wikipedia. And I'm like, no, you can't. You actually can't do that. That doesn't work. You actually have to read these 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 authors in a in a really profound and, and contemplative fashion. And that's just something pe people in general can't do anymore. Um so I that that's my crabby that's my crabby old guide self. Um, I, I, I are you I finding that you can't even use writing as a mechanism of testing because of ChatGPT in the university system? Is it hard to do that now? I, I haven't seen that yet. Um, I'm sure that will come. Um, you know, kid, uh, students will try to essentially fake a term paper, um, but you know, I teach at a very elite. Um, university where the the young people are extremely smart, and I've read papers by undergraduates that are as good or better than anything I've ever read um, uh, elsewhere. So I I know I know people can still do this, um, but I, I I guess I, I guess I want them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see I want to see more of it and. I, I do think we've lost a lot um, by losing the book. Yeah, the fragmentation of our attention uh, has been profound in, in many yeah. ways uh, since the iPhone, really. And I mean, come yeah. on. I, let me go now and do my, my yeah. text message. I mean, I, it's really bad. And when do we read? I mean, when do we read? And I mean really read. I mean, read an author that's not easy and and spend hundreds of hours with this author and and not not 30 seconds or 10 minutes or something
well, it's getting harder to actually do it. Cause like you said, it's even less a choice. It's like, I'm having trouble sticking with it. Uh, unless yeah. it's, it's more engaging or, you know, yeah. yeah, I got to check my email now, or I've got to, you know, this thing, this ding. Or, or, the, or the writing itself has to be kind of, um, I don't want to say dumbed down. And, you but... know, I, so here's the other thing. Okay, this is still Krabby Jeff talking. So my main spiritual practice is, in fact, writing. And I write every morning, and I get up very early, and I write, and I publish books. And the reason I do that is, first of all, it makes me happy. I, I, it's a spiritual practice for me. It's a discipline, but I also hear from readers and very strange and wonderful things happen around reading these books. And I realize that those books can impact people all around the globe, 24 hours a day, regardless of my state of mind. And that I don't even have to be alive. <laughs> I mean, they're going to continue doing work after after I'm dead. And to me, that's an amazing thing that that is not available in any other way. And I, I really believe in that. I, I really believe that there's something profound that happens in the act of reading and that an author can put his or her or their heart and soul on the page and that the reader can essentially reenact or, or, or invoke that presence and, and similar kind of work can be done. So there's a kind of, you know, that's a scriptural conviction, I guess, which I, which I very much hold um, because I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Um, and, and I, I know it can happen. So. I, I feel similarly about recorded music and that if I'm long gone, people yeah. can use it well, in the same ways and so i get it it's just a different medium i think music you know the truth is most human beings have not been able to read in human history but mm. they have been able to listen to music or play music and, right yeah. Yeah. yeah well they haven't necessarily been able to play it either well, but, you know, sing it or you know it's their yeah. participatory yeah. yeah or or art you know yeah. most people have have imbibed the the worldview through art and architecture and so there are these media that I think are really um, powerful and really exist well after we're gone. We're so temporary. We're so, our lives are so short, regardless of what we think. Um, and, mu you know, music is something that I don't understand, actually. There, 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 were two, there were two classes in the seminary that I almost failed. One was Christian ethics, <laughs> um, and the other was musicology. And I just... I just didn't have an ear. I mean, the the other the other they were all men. The other guys in the class, they they really understood music and they could hear they could hear things and they could write it down. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it's just like, no, uh, sorry, I I not don't get it. And um, but I understand that other people do have that gift, and and so that. And I love music. I'm like all other human beings. I That's love That's what music. I was going to say. Like you can still oh, gosh, respond yeah. to music as we all can, which is so amazing. Yeah. But, but people are different again. And, and we don't all have those musical abilities. And I don't think we all have spiritual abilities. And we don't all have intellectual or mathematical abilities. People are really different. And um, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Well... It, let me we'll end this by let me just tell me like what you're kind of excited about or interested in right now and or if there's something we could point mm -hmm. people to yeah so what i'm most excited about is something called the archives of the impossible which is a project at rice university it's an actual archive that that i oversee and jacques Vallée, um actually started it um about 10 years ago now with his we we negotiated his gift and these are these are gifts uh, of of writers really around anomalous phenomena uh, some of its ufo related some of its physical mediumship some of its remote viewing some of its you know there's a lot of a lot of it spans a lot of different issues and i'm interested in this 
for all the reasons we talked about, it will far, far, it will live far, far beyond my own lifetime. And people from all over the country or even the world can come and do research in this, these archives and find things that are just totally wild and just don't fit in. And that's kind of, that's the point. I, 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 as, as an intellectual or as a thinker, I'm really, I'm most interested in things that don't fit in. And, and that's, I suppose that's my bias, but I, I do believe that human beings, none of us fit in, you know, even people who think they fit into a culture, they really don't. They're, they're just kind of kidding themselves for a while. And, and, and I think, I think human experience is always exceeding <laughs> whatever the culture or the religion happens to be at the time. And, and so I, I put my, my money on the human being, not, not on the culture or the religion. Culture is not your friend. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's also <laughs> your enemy. I mean, come on. I mean, people suffer because of their cultures. Yeah. Well, where can people find you and your books? I'm suppose that they're kind of everywhere, but. Um, so I have a website that's really good, which means I did not create it. <laughs> <laughs> it's called jeffreyjcrapel.com. Huh, cool. And that's the best place to go. And you can't buy anything there, but you can kind of get a, a summary of everything. You just go on whatever, wherever you buy your books. I mean, that they'll pop right up. It's mostly University of Chicago Press is where I publish out of, but it's all available in the usual, usual channels. Great. I really enjoyed this. Um, I hope we can do it again or maybe cross paths at Esalen yeah, or it. elsewhere. Let's do it again when, when I figure out the truth. And, yeah, uh, yeah, that was on my list. Truth. We didn't get to it. No. Yeah, maybe when, maybe when Congress f figures out the truth, we can we can we can. <laughs> oh, God. They, they figured it out. I won't hold my breath. Yeah. <laughs> They yeah. did it. You know, those, 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 those Some people. senator from Alabama finally got the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, it was fun talking and um, thank you for taking the time and a hot day. Yeah. You too. I, and thanks for putting up with my digital confusion there for a moment. Oh, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah.